Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Rue Garber, and I'm with the Gloucester County Historical Society. And I'd like to, you know, thank you for coming out and welcome you for a third in a series of Gloucester County Historical Society treasures. And if this seminar will be led by Greg Perry, a renowned furniture restorer and preservationist. And um, as I said, if Greg were to be alive 250 years ago, some of his clients would be our founding fathers and mothers. Let's not leave out the mothers. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And you want to mention the up and coming uh, symposium? And, and the, the up and coming table. symposium on our pie crust table, which we think is from the Frank Fish collection, a beautiful 18th century piece, will be held next month, the last Saturday, and um, I think it's March 26th. Thanks for the kind words, Mary. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Greg Perry here, welcome to the Historic Preservationist. This is season one, episode five. We are here at the Gloucester County Historical Society in historic Woodbury, New Jersey. Uh, today we're going to be talking about chess. We, we briefly touched chess last time when we were talking about the William Savory secretary behind chess in the standpoint of the development of the lower section of the desk. Um, today we're going to be talking about some very early chess. So we're going to do a contrast and comparison about the society's piece here, uh, which is made, has Chester County influence. We assume winter tours come on occasion many years ago and they feel that its origins are in Chester County. Doesn't mean it's necessarily so. Don't remember, somebody could have been traveling through Chester County. Somebody may have lived there and they come over to this, this side of the river and say, yeah, I, I saw something a while back, I want to copy it. So that could always be the case. Just because it looks and smells like it doesn't mean it's the real thing, but it's very close. It has influence, it has style of, so let's not forget that. Okay, so we're going to contrast and comparison a piece in my collection right now, and uh, around the same time period, we're going to get to that. And just take a notice, first of all, smaller is better. Smaller is better, proportion, Israel sack, remember Israel sacks, good, best, and better. Um, nice and tight, 33 inches here, 31 inches wide here. So proportionally, a little bit more than a square, the golden mean, the golden triangle, we're all trying to represent those, uh, those proportions, but this guy is good. This particular chest is in deep trouble, and uh, this has some issues, but nothing super bad. But uh, you may be able to see from the audience that this has severe veneer problems on all four sides. And when this chest was made, what they didn't do, they didn't dry the veneer out properly before they adhered it and it sat on the chest for a number of years, 20, 30, 50, 60, 70 years, and it dried out and it's all constricting and pulling and, and falling off. But not really falling off, but it's all cracked severely. Our problem with the society's chest, it's missing its feet, okay? And this chest is the first quarter of the 18th century, 1710, 1720s, 25, something like that. I feel it's that, Winter Tour feels it's that, so we're in that ballpark. But again, don't forget that the chest could also have been made 50 years ahead of time. Just suppose a craftsman on Sunday afternoon said nothing better to do. He was a farmer. He says, you know, I think we're going to make one for the house. He was a good woodworker. But I don't think that's the case. But just there's always a possibility of that. This is definitely around the same time period, a bit earlier, about 1690, uh, made on the outskirts near Utley, where Thomas Chippendale, the town he's from, that this is where this piece was actually made. And uh, to say this piece has had a hard life is putting it quite mildly. So let's do a contrast and comparison. So what do both of these chests have? They have inlay, inlay stringy, okay? Um, we're going to take a look at the drawer fronts. First off, the, one of the more interesting things is these are secret locks. So everyone needs to keep their valuables, their jewelry, their, what cash they have on hand. So this is a spring lock. Winter Tour is going to call this a Quaker lock. Quaker lock. Um, if you're in Lancaster County, up where I have a, my other studios in Berks County, you're going to call it a Dutch lock. So it's whatever area you're in, you can call it the lock you want to call. But nevertheless, you're going to pull this drawer out, you're going to put, push the flap up, the spring in the flap, and you're going to release these two top drawers. Now the Society's chest is, uh, and I'm not sure everyone can see this, but it's, it's inlaid. And it has an inlay around the perimeter of the drawer front, plus what's characteristic of Chester County is a tulip inlay. So you have a tulip going to the left, a tulip going to the right. 
These were done in holly or boxwood, whatever the whatever trees you or bushes you had in the area. And uh, so there's a couple things that have to happen here. So you have to lay your design out wherever, on the chest or on the drawer front. You have to evacuate the material that you're going to inlet or inlay the holly with. Also, we find that these were done in sulfur. So what they would do, once they, they did the evacuation, they would actually melt yellow sulfur over the whole drawer front and then come back with a cabinet scraper and scrape back and forth till they got level with the wood surface and then polish it with stingray skin, I don't know if we talked about before, but uh, there was no such thing as sandpaper back in the 18th century. So you would have had a, a, a boutique on South Street in Philadelphia and they would have sold various levels of grit of stingray and shark skin used as abrasives. So a young, a young, young shark, maybe uh, six months to a year old, is very fine, like a 220 grit today. And a shark that's five, six years old is going to be very abrasive, like an 80 grit. So you would have these sh stingray and shark skins in your studio, and very, very expensive, but only the better cabinet makers did. So once we evacuated this, and we're going to talk about this, how we evacuate this. So we have to have a, a very fine groove. It's a sixteenth of an inch. It's perfection. I mean, it's absolute perfection. These, these lines are so straight. And then they drew, they drew the tulip, and the tulip terminates in, in berries, okay, three berries each. And um, so how they would do that, they're either going to do that with a series of knives and scraping tools, the only way you could do that. So you're going to pull a tool. I'm going to show you the tool right now. We don't, uh, we're not set up here to do the demonstration, but we're going to show the tool. So a tool like this I'm using, it has an adjustable fence, and it has a cutter sitting right here. There's a cutter right here. So what you would do is you're going to adjust it to the width end that you want to put your inlay line. You're going to put the fence against a piece and you're going to pull back and forth, back and forth. And you're actually going to cut using a cutter here, which when it, ru when it runs out, you're going to pull it out and you're going to sharpen it up. You're going to pull it this way, this way, all the way around the drawer front. You're going to do the same thing around the t perimeter of the top. Same with this. Afterwards, you come up, take a look at this, and you can adjust. In an infinite number of, of inlay cuts you can do. That's how the straight lines were done. Now these are modern tools. Just imagine you just had a trammel. You just had a, a, a piece of wood, you put a sharp object on that you could plant it somewhere on this drawer front. And you had a cutter. You had just a piece of steel, hard steel. And you're going to put the trammel and you're going to spin it like this. And that's how you got these concentric ovals that you're going to see on the top of this chest and on this chest and the drawer fronts. But what we have here is a more modern tool for architects. So it has a, a pivot point and it has a cutter that you can put on the end. And literally, you're going to find a place and you're going to turn like this and you're going to create the tulip. You can and come back and create the other side of the tulip and create the leaves of the tulip. And that's all it is, but just repetitive scrapes and cuts until you get to the desired, desired depth. And what you would do is you just make a mark on your cutter so you know how deep you're going. After that, you want to come back with a knife to do any clean out you need to do. And then, hence, it's all evacuated. So your design is evacuated, whether it be on the top, on the drawer fronts, or the top here. The next thing we need to do, we need to determine what are we going to inlay with, boxwood, holly or the sulfur. The sulfur is easy. It was attainable all over in the 18th century. But the boxwood and holly have to be a little bit tricky, particularly, again, I'm not sure everyone can see this, but it's a tulip design. So you, you have to take a thin piece of wood, a sixteenth of an inch wide, by a sixteenth of an inch. Very fragile, particularly in holly or in boxwood. They're very straight grained woods, but they're very susceptible and very hard to breakage. So what we need to do is we need to have a fire. So we'd have a fire here with a cauldron, and we, we create these little strings of wood, and we put them in there, and they get super saturated. The cell walls explode, and they be become very pliable. So we take them, and we just start forcing them to the hole where we have to put the, the rounder curved sections. We just force them in and gently tap with a hammer. The straight sections, we don't have to wet down. We can just simply insert into the slit. And what we're doing is using high glue again. So that we talked about high glue last time, the animal glue melting down the hides. So you're just going to put a little bit of high glue, force that in around, and when all this dries, we're going to come back with a cabinet scraper and scrape this flat, and then do any, any abrasives we need with shark skin or stingray skin. So that's the general principle. And then it comes down to the berries. This is a line and berry chest, okay? 
So the possibilities are drill bits were non-existent at this early stage. They were there, but they were very expensive and uh, very, the distribution was very limited. But what was there were carving chisels. Some kind of chisels you may make your own. If you, you had enough money, you could go down to the supply store in Philadelphia and buy one. And these come in all different sweeps and, and dimensions. So you would find something of the burr you want, you would strike with a hammer and go around in a circle until you created a cut. And then you'll simply get and pop that out. And you would have to cut or whittle a berry, a round object, and plug it in there. And again, scraping it down, scraping it down. So it looks like here, they have something that looks almost like a, a cherry. Remember the background of this is walnut. This is walnut. So you're seeing the difference between, we're going to call this English walnut, but remember, England did not have any walnuts. English walnut was French walnut. So when English and French got into a tizzy, or it was a very, very bad winter, or two consecutive bad winters, somewhere in the late 17th century, and it killed a lot of the French walnut trees. And the French said, hey, you know, our furniture guys come first, we're not going to sell this to England, and then there was trade issues with the countries, they're semi at war, so they cut England off because of the, these two very cold winters and the pending war. So then at that point, England, the leader in furniture around the world in the 18th century, said, we're going to switch to mahogany. We're, we're moving mahogany back and forth to the West Indies, to Jamaica and Cuba, before Cuba was Cuba, and we're trading for slaves. So that's how the slave trade really kicked up in the history of the world in the 18th century, and that's how the mahogany era came in in the, uh, in the George I furniture. Okay, so we, we know how to evacuate, we knew how this wood was, uh, was put in, it was glued in. And I'll show you this little thing here. This is a, uh, this is a, a, a tool that I've made up, and this is for stringing. So what I do is I, I have a cutter. I've made cutters on the back side. And I'll make a, a rip on the saw, a very thin piece. It's heavier than a sixteenth of an inch, maybe three thirty seconds by three thirty seconds. I will take that piece of wood and feed it through here, this very thin three foot piece of wood that I need, and I will pull it through here. It's being forced through the side of this fence on the other side by the cutter. It will dimension it down to a sixteenth of an inch for me. I will take and flip it one side, one turn, put it back in and pull it, just pull it like this. And I have it a sixteenth by sixteenth by whatever length I need, and I can chop it to the length I need. So these are all the inlaid tools they need to do what they needed to do. Stringer. And if we look at the top of our society's chest here, we have inlaid two very big tulips, two very big leaves, or the leaves, two, two leaves in either corner. So to do this, again, what we're going to do, this would be a freehand scribe, or using, again, larger carving tools, sculpting tools, and literally sculpting around the, the tulip. The tulip is about this big on the top, the tulip motif. And you want to go around the perimeter and incise it. This was a router plane. They had these since the 1650s. Literally, this is the cutter here. You drop it down. So once you start your hole or opening, you're going to put the router plane over that opening and you're going to move it back and forth like this with this cutter that's flat with the bottom surface. And you can evacuate very, very tiny areas up to a sixteenth of an inch because I have different size cutters to get into very tight spaces. So a router plane would have been used in that instance. So here are the very basic tools that you need to do what we need to do here. So this is solid walnut. And we, want to, we can talk about the construction. The construction is very similar here. The ribbing is similar. But the interesting thing is, you're looking at this maybe 20, 25 years earlier, the English piece, than the piece here from Chester County. And you can see just basically half round moldings applied around the drawer fronts, around the superstructure in the frame. Here, it's just a little bit more upscale. They put a little fillet here on either side to go around the molding, just to make it a little more. The other thing that we have going on here that's unfortunately sad is somebody's upgraded or changed the brasses. So typically the brass is what's going to be a, a very minute brass, maybe two inches in diameter, that's going to be pierced and engraved. And they're going to be called cotter pin brasses because in the back there's going to be two pieces of metal going back and you'll peel it over like cotter pins that we know in the hardware store. But unfortunately these have been put on. So these should be put back into that era of hardware, but the difficulty here being, now we have two extra holes. 
these things are very difficult to hide. That's where the restorer, the conservator comes in to fill the holes in and to literally camouflage the holes so no one sees them. Anybody can do that. The issue is, is that what happens 5, 10, 15, 25 years from now? So with ambient light, oxidation occurring, a lot of moisture in the air, environmental pollution, how does it change the, 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 the materials I've used to fill that hole and to color it over? They're the issues here. So we want to try to use like materials. We want to actually get some sawdust, say from a, a piece here, the a part of the chest that you can't see, grind it up and actually paint with shellac over the repair so you actually have like material going over that hole so it tends to camouflage and this is going to continue to age the way it should all at once and all together. But what we're seeing on the top is a lot of environmental dirt here and this is, this is from the, the, cooks, the cook, the stove or the open hearth fireplace. You get oils in the air, they land here and back in the day throughout the 18th century up until probably the third quarter of the 19th century we would have itinerant finishers coming around. So you'd have somebody knocking on your door once a year, once every two years, and say, you know, uh, I only charge this, this much. Um, uh, if I can sleep in your barn tonight and you guys could feed me something, I'll go in the next week and I'll do all your furniture. So nobody cleaned the furniture. So this is what we talk about when we talk about patentization. So this is the patina. The patina is the building of all these dirt and grime layers of finish, finish, dirt, grime, finish. So when you look at micro photographs, you can, you can age and, and deduct and deduce where these things have happened in time. And, and it's a good indicator. Some, some finishes are better than others until we got to the 19th century. We have a chest on chest in the other room that someone's put actually an oil varnish over the shellac. And when that happens, when the oil, oil varnish dries out, it tends to alligator and pull away. So it looks, it's, it's in a very bad state at this point. Uh, but probably for the first 30, 40, 50 years, it looked very beautiful. It had a high gloss and, and everybody liked it. And the man, man that did it didn't even consider, or whoever did it rather, didn't consider the ramifications later on. Now it's very difficult to get that oil finish off of that piece without damaging the shellac finish underneath. So standing here, I cannot see any of the decoration on the top. And then you get back to what we actually talked last time with the savory chest. Where do we go with this piece? What do we want to do with this piece? I mean, if we have museum goers coming here and they want to see the great Ogden chest, and that was the name of the people that owned it, the Ogdens, um, what are they looking at? People are confused. It looks like just some dirty old wood. So if you were in France and you were restored today, you would cut back all of this dirt and grime off here, a lot of the patina down to the original. So the French restorers and conservators the, what they abide by by the federal government, and the federal government sets these mandates. The federal government in France actually cares what their furniture looks like and their, their decorative arts. Not like here, there's no such thing as standards of anything in the art world. So, in France it would be a total cutback, and this piece would look the way it did coming out of the cabinet maker's envoy or workshop day one. Uh, I think that's a bit extreme. Uh, in England, we tend to cut back the finish just a tad bit, the finish down to the surface of the wood. So the French go a little bit subsurface to get all the beautiful colors of the tulips, the leaves, all the inlay so it pops. But the English just take the top surfaces of the finish off and we see the beautiful wood. So you, you lost half the patina. So you lost a really a, the dirty part of the patina. And in, in America, in America, the restorers, because of the way the antique dealers are here and everything is, a lot of fakes occur here, more fakes, from my experience of living and working in Europe, more fakes occur here in the U.S. than both England and France combined. So they like to keep it nice and dirty, so just suppose there were no tulips in there. And they're trying to sell this as the, a tulip chest at the Brandywine River Antique Show. Well, then they can go down to their, uh, their, their faker down the street and say, Put a couple tulips in there. We're going we're gonna to try and tie it into a maker in Chester County. And as long as we keep it dirty, he can put a lot of smuts on it, a lot of grime on it, and say, oh, yeah, that's all original. And that's, uh, you know, it's worth, you know, it's worth thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. But, you know, that's, 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 the, that's the fakery that we find. So go in any one of these antique shows and you walk around and, and you can start questioning a lot of these people about their techniques and what they're using. And, uh, so. My recommendation is we're going to cut back a little bit on the top. We want to see the inlay. We need, the museum goers need to see what's going on with this piece. 
So uh, the main thing here, beyond the hardware, beyond the cleanup, structurally, this chest is in good order. And at, you, at the end of the, the, the talk, you come back and you can see there's two huge hand plane backboards. These backboards on, on this piece are from a pit saw. So a pit saw, as we talked last time, you would have had a pit dug and you would have had the log here, a fellow in the pit, someone on top of the log, and a huge saw, and they would literally walk down the saw and cut boards up into like a quarter inch thick that were 26, 28, 30 inches wide. Pretty amazing stuff. I mean, just imagine going down 30 feet of log. That's probably a two-day job just in itself. So these backboards are totally original. They're, they're well oxidized. They're very rough and crude, and, and, and it feels good. So up and beyond the finish issue, we have the hardware. And you know that'll be a piece-by-piece -piece basis. And you know possibly we won't go to the original hardware, the style hardware that should have been on here, because it's not going to cover the holes. So we're going to play a little bit, see how we can camouflage some of the holes up. And if it doesn't work, this is totally the wrong hardware. This is in the, the third quarter of the 18th century. So this is about seven, 50 to 75 years off. So it's totally, totally wrong. So the big thing here, and you can decipher from these two chests, this, this is sitting right on the floor. It's missing its feet. So why is it missing its feet? It's probably lived in a lot of houses that had dirt, you have brick as, as a floor, and the ambient moisture is coming up through the brick all the time, into the, into the, particularly the end grain, because that ball foot like is on here, the end grain is facing down. It's like a straw sucking that up. All year long, it's just sucking moisture up and expanding. But then when you heat the, the area up, the living area, all the moisture goes out. And then it sucks more up. And it so it expands, contracts, and eventually it, it draws bacteria. It starts to rot. Uh, it gets mold, etc. So then somebody said, look, this is an old chest. Let's just throw the feet out. They're half rotten anyway. Maybe one fell off. So it was too much work, possibly to put the feet back on to have a turner. Maybe they didn't know any turners. They're out in the middle, whoever owned this chest at the time. So they just pushed it around on the, on the floor like this. So then somebody has taken the actual base molding off down here, and they've taken the feet off. The bun, and they're called bun feet. So bun feet actually, uh, this is a very good represent, representation. It's supposed to look like somewhat of a squashed foot, which this is. Um, so if you see a foot on, on one of these that's a total ball, it's, it's, it's a very bad misrepresentation. So they were squashed and you know, there's a, a, little bit of a, a little bit of a cove here, about an inch of a cove right under the base of the chest and then it segues into the actually squashed or bun ball. Okay? So if you see a, a totally round ball that has maybe a straight shaft right from under the, the bottom of the chest, that is, that is not correct. So. And what we're going to try to do is, what we're going to do is we're going to find old wood. We're going to find 18th century wood that's been used possibly in timber framing, walnut wood. And so we have similar grain structure because remember over the years the grain of wood has changed. Uh, back when these chests were made, England and America, um, you're dealing with trees that were probably 2,000 years old now. So when we go out or when I go out to a wood mill to, to, to procure new wood at this point, the trees are probably 250, 300, maybe 400 years old, so they're not really that old. And in the same token, that, that cellular structure over trees that were seven, 800,000 years old has considerably changed. It's different. It will never accept. We can make it out of that, but what, what's going to happen is when the light hits that newer wood, that young wood, it's going to reflect back to our eyes quite differently and we're not going to see the same, because the cellular structure is quite different. So again, we're looking for old wood and to put back a shellac finish that's on here. And to redo the, the locks, as they call them, the Quaker locks or the, just the, uh, the spring locks underneath these two drawers. So when you see this next time, um, it's going to have all the inlay, the tulips, the line and barrier are literally going to jump out at you in the front and on the top. It's going to be a good representation. In addition, on a structural basis, it's fairly tight. I don't think we'd recommend we do anything with it, but we have a, a quite the broad separation of the top. Uh, we'll probably go with a couple large dovetails with under, from underneath just to secure the top together because there is some movement here. And, uh, so let's, let's take a look at our European chest, our English chest, made of French walnut, pseudo-English walnut. And you can see something very interesting going on here. Um, again, solid walnut here. This is walnut. What is it? Walnut, what is it? That's the question. So the carcass of this is made out of pine. It's made out of English pine. Some of them were actually made out of yew. Yew trees were ancient in the 18th century, some two, 3,000 years old. 
the yew tree is virtually extinct now, but this has parts of it in yew. And I want to go back and mention that the primary wood is walnut, the secondary wood in this piece, the backboards, some interior pieces are all in poplar. The, uh, the underside of the drawers here are in cedar, and the drawer runners are in oak. So why did they do that? Oak, extremely durable. You have the drawers back and forth, back and forth. If you did the oak runners and the runners for the drawers in pine, everything would have worn out. You would be constantly replacing them. So these appear to be the original runners. Um, there were some questions um, in some of the write-ups on these pieces. Um, there are no dust boards, usually in higher style furniture, Philadelphia furniture, not so much Chester County furniture, an occasional Chester County piece, between where the ribbing is, between the drawers, you would have had a, a, a piece, a raised panel slid in from the back before the back was put on. And this would, would control dust. So every time you pull that one drawer out over the other drawer, the, the dust that's being created from the friction is going to drop down. So if you, if you have the dust panel, then it's, everything is contained in there and your, your clothing and what, whatnot will be you know, relatively dirt free. So we have the interior of this chest made out of pine and a little bit of you, and it's veneered, totally veneered. So what is it veneered in? This was the rage from 1680 to about uh, 1705 in France and in England. So this is called oyster veneering. So oyster veneering is, is taking branch stock, and particularly whoever started doing this would use king wood. So king wood was a very dark wood, and we just happen to have some here found in our William Savory Secretary. I don't know, it's probably been sitting here for about 200 years or so, and it's very interesting. But no, I brought this in, and there's only one developer or harvester of this wood, and he's in Paris, and uh, he's a friend. He's called J. George, and J. George is a family that's operated for 350 years in the center of Paris, and there's the veneer cutters. And they have so little work right now that the business has been up for sale for about uh, 10 or 15 years of trying to sell it. And it's, it's very sad. So right now, I think we're in a fifth generation, and, and he's in his 70s or 80s. And uh, they actually started with steam power somewhere around in the uh, 18, 1890s. They started with a steam power saw. So they took the pit saw that men would hold up and down, and they, they reconfigured this from an automobile engine, and this was steam powered. And that saw is still there, and you can go see it in, in George's, uh, George's uh, studio in Paris. So what this is, this is made up of king wood. And king wood is a purplish wood. So what has happened to this, this is the background of our chest here is in walnut. All the inlay on the sides, the top, and the drawer fronts, and we'll call it inlay, but maybe it's not really as inlay as we think it is. It is actually veneered with king wood. And king wood is taken from the oblique. So the oblique would be taking not trunk stock, which the chest is made out of, but branch stock. So this is a branch of a tree from the kingwood tree from Africa, which is extinct now. And they would cut, the, not just do a cross cut on the branch, but they would cut it, cross cut it on an angle, and they would give it more reflecting rays. So they would take these, they would square them, and then they would just glue them or veneer them to the drawer fronts, the sides, and the top. So not only did that, when they did that, then they would come with a cabinet scraper and they scraped this whole top smooth. And then as you come up later on and look, they would put actually concentric circles into the kingwood or the oystering. So they, somebody felt, when you look at this, it looks like an oyster on the top. So they take one and one and they open it, almost like a book inlaying, a book match inlay of oystering. So it, it's called oystering. So this is kingwood oystering. So it's very rare. And there, there may only be, you know, 150 to 200 of these chests or, or type pieces with this type of veneering, so they're extraordinarily rare. Um, and, and I've seen very few. I've only touched about 10. And uh, this guy was in a flood down here. You can see the, the, the water issue uh, before I got my hands on it, but it's, it's still together. So what, what we're going to do with this, we're going to consolidate this. This, for the most part, the veneer is still attached to the substrate but it's undergone severe cracking. But what they did was, this veneer is an eighth of an inch thick, extraordinarily thick for, and this is European. So remember the Americans, although there's no veneer on here, but when the Americans did veneering, they're using a sixteenth of an inch or less, very thin stock. 
but the Europeans are very, very thick stuck. So we have a lot of material to work with here. So what we need to do is you look at the top, every crack we're going to go over with a knife and we're going to open that crack up very slightly and we're going to create, create some conservation uh, adhesion, uh, adhesives and actually put down in the cracks. So the whole piece will be going over and then it's going to be abraded down and, uh, and then French polished. So a lot of work here, but well worth it because it's, it's a survivor and well worth saving. The Dutch locks or the Quaker locks as we have would never have been used in this. In England, we would have had the real deal. So we have early English locks from about 1700 in here. If they have no keys, I'll end up making a key for each lock. Each, each lock is different. They have locks down the drawers also. But original bun feet, so when we lay this over, there is some degradation. There's water degradation going up into those feet. There, so I will end up consolidating and, and locking in those cells so no further degradation occurs. But of course now it's going to be in the museum, on a floor, that, that it's not sucking up ambient moisture anymore. And uh, so, you know, again from the side view here you can see that the depth and the thickness of this when you come up, we'll get this for the camera, but it's extraordinarily thick and it just gives us a lot of workroom on this piece. There are other ways that as this chest evolved, probably into the 18, uh, 1750s, so it's no longer a line and bury chest, so just imagine America, they start veneering this chest. So what did they do? So in my, in my stint, in my time in Paris, I was, a, I was an apprentice under the number two marquetry producer in, in Paris, and this is back in 03 to 05, 2003, 2005. So what they would do in America when they started going into the federal period, and they were going to take this type of chest and veneer it, they're going to produce a piece of veneer separately and veneer this down to the top of the chest. So, and, and this is marquetry, so this is cutting on a, on a it's called a chavalet or uh, like an 18th century style jigsaw, and you're using a sandwich method, but this will be fodder for an, one of our other episodes on the historic preservation is coming up. So that'll be talking about bull style marquetry, and uh, so they would create this, this would be the face side down, they would put this down with hot coals, glue this down, and when the glue had dried, they put water on the paper on the back and peeled the paper up and voila, your, your marquetry is down and it's ready for French polishing. So that was the evolution about how we got from, you know, bucolic chest with little inlay to high inlay or high marquetry style on top of these. So, uh, I think that wraps us up here for this episode of the Historic Preservationist. Does anyone have any questions? And if they do, we're not set up with the mic that, today, but I will uh, repeat the questions and then uh, give you an answer. Yes, sir. Yeah, so as far as um, like modern chemical cleaning agents like Pledge and everything like that, what kind of effect does that have on the wood of this age? I mean, is that something you would recommend? Or how do we clean something like this without, without damaging it? Have a piece like this. Any, any, anything that's over the counter you can buy at, at, the, at the 5 and 10 you want to stay away from. So all the pledges, the old Englishes. So he asked cleaning agents, sprucing up agents like pledge, old English, are they viable? Should they be used on these type of pieces or any pieces of importance or how do they reflect on wood? Um, all those contain silicone. So the, the manufacturers are putting silicone in there and they want you to come and they want you to spray and say, oh, sweetie, look at this. My God, you just restored the chest by that 69 cents can of pledge. And, and what's happening, unfortunately, they're all silicone based. So the silicone goes down in the wood. It changes the color of the wood. I'm just assuming we put it on here. It's going in the cracks and it's actually changing the color that we can't even see. But up and beyond that, it's stuck in the cracks. So when we try to put finish back on, the, the silicone is going to repel the finish. So we try to put finish on this, a new finish, and it's all going to bubble up and create a fish-eyed situation. So the bottom line is you stay away from anything you buy at the supermarket, the hardware store. What you need to do is, the far as you want to go is you, you do, use a detergent, use a soap detergent to clean something. Put a little bit of detergent, a little bit of water, don't put a lot of water, and go over and try to clean the dirt off. The second thing we like to use is use alcohol. But be very careful. So you're going to take a cotton cloth, put a little bit of alcohol, um, grain alcohol. So go down to your, your favorite liquor spot and get uh, good old grain alcohol and put a little bit on a pad, form a ball or tampon or mouse as the French call, and then just go back and forth over the top with this. 
just as, as wet as a dog's nose. That's all we want. So go back and forth and you're going to look at your pad and say, wow, look, all that dirt's coming off. Yes, that's environmental impact. So that's coming off for you. So that's the first time. If you want to refinish, all these chests should be refinished in shellac. Okay, so it's t traditional 18th century finish. Um, if it's very, very bucolic backwoods, like the wood chest, which we're going to have a later episode coming up on, this has been badly treated, badly treated. Somebody's put a, a, a polyurethane finish on this, and it's destroying the wood on this chest, unfortunately. So the recommendation that, that, that all that finish has got to be pulled off. So you're going to put a shellac finish on. If, it's, if you're the homeowner, you can do it with a brush, do it very light strokes. If you can, if you feel more, uh, try to pad it on. You literally put it on a pad and what you want to do is put some mineral oil in the pad, two or three drops of mineral oil and just make the pad with shellac moist and just go back and forth with the pad, assuming this was the pad, back and forth, back and forth and never overlap much because when you overlap, you're making that last lap streak is very wet and it's going to stick and then you're going to pull finish off. So the, the mineral oil is going to actually be a, a lubricant and glide you over and, and enable you to lay down a finish without pulling up the finish you just put down. Anybody else have any questions today? Sorry, ma'am? Uh, the two top drawers, well, uh, I don't know if that's original or, or what happened to the brass. Why, it seemed they're not in the same place. Oh, yeah, the, these, these, these brass, the, 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 the lady's asking, what happened to the brasses? I mean, these, these are not the correct brasses, nor are they in the correct place. But that one's much higher. It, because so many... And the inlay's right, different, too. Right, right. The, uh, the, inlay, the inlay, as I can see it from here, is very close to being the same from a very crude hand. But the, the hardware is wrong and the placement's wrong. Yes, yes. So that has to be rectified if, if the society wants that. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for attending, and uh, we'll be looking at you coming up for the pie crust table here at the uh, Gloucester County Historical Society. And when we're done in a few minutes, everybody come up, and we'll answer questions right around these pieces. And uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>